Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ingenious Talks Online, Design of Long-Term Care Homes, Learning for the Future. Thank you for joining us today. So my name is Laura Kilpatrick, and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's event. So we're going to start with a few housekeeping items. So this is a Zoom webinar, which means that all video, or sorry, all attendee microphones and videos have been disabled. However, you do have the option to ask questions by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. While questions will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation, we do highly encourage you to ask them as they come to mind. So that's by typing in the Q&A box on your screen. So you do not need to wait until the question and answer periods to submit your question. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but please be mindful that with a high volume, we cannot guarantee that all will be answered. You may also use the chat box on your screen to talk amongst each other and share ideas. So today's webinar will be recorded and posted to Carlton's YouTube channel. And finally, at the conclusion of the webinar, um, a brief survey will appear on the screen. So if you do have the time to fill it out, we would really appreciate that. We really value your feedback. So all answers are anonymous. So now I'm pleased to introduce to you our speaker, Professor Chantal Trudel. Chantal Trudel is an associate professor in the School of Industrial Design at Carleton University. She is an, an industrial designer and ergonomist, human factors professional, with over 10 years of industry experience in architecture and healthcare planning. Her healthcare design work has received prestigious recommendations and recognitions, um, including the Canadian Architect Award of Excellence in 2010 and a high commendation from the International Academy for Design in 2012 for the Women and Newborn Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba. In 2018, her research and design for infection prevention and control was one of the three most cited publications within three years in the proceedings of the International Symposium on Human Factors and Ergonomics in Healthcare. The work has also been cited by researchers from John Hopkins University, Emory School, University School of Medicine, and the Centers for Disease Control. Today, Professor Trudeau will be speaking to you about the design of long-term care homes, learning for the future. Please help me in welcoming Professor Trudeau. Thank you very much, Laura, for the nice introduction and uh, welcome everyone. I hope you find uh, the work we're doing interesting and, and of help um, uh, to your community. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the land on which Carleton is situated is unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Nation. Today, I'm going to discuss research our team has been doing in long-term care, which has been focused on design, infection prevention, control, and quality of life. And uh, it's important to note that the project has been generously supported by Carleton University's COVID-19 Rapid Research Fund, but also the Foundation for Health Environments Research in the United States. The project has recently received ethics clearance, which we're very pleased about from the Breer Research Institute and Carleton University, and we're currently in the process of recruiting homes for this study. I'd also like to acknowledge our team members from Carleton School of Social Work, Systems and Computer Engineering, Breer's Memory Program, Breer Research Institute, and the Ontario Centers for Learning, Research and Innovation in Long-Term Care and the University of Ottawa. Our team includes Dr. Susan Bradley, Dennis Cow, Amy Shu, Frank, Anufel, Sophie Orost, Heidi Zweistrup, and Bruce Wallace. So long-term care is a very complex field with respect to design, but there's also been some important uh, seminal research that's already established in this area, which I have some examples of on this slide. For example, a seminal report by Angeli Joseph from the Center for Health Design back in 2006 uh, co covered key considerations in long-term care design, and more recently a publication by Pat Armstrong and Susan Bradley in 2016 focused on the physical environments in long-term care. So the, the question is, why should we care about the design of long-term care homes? So some of you may have family and friends either living or working in long-term care 
or working in similar conditions such as retirement homes or assisted living homes. And we just can't begin to imagine what their day-to-day -day experiences are like working and living during the pandemic. Second, and this is more directed to each of us, is we might one, need, one day need long-term care services depending on our abilities. And it's not improbable considering the, the state of chronic conditions in Canada and how that's changing. So according to a study out of the Center for Chronic Disease Prevention, three out of five Canadians older than 20 have a chronic disease with rates of chronic disease increasing 14% each year due to factors such as obesity, living longer or younger onset of chronic conditions. So this affects all of us. So despite um, the great work that's been done in long-term care design uh, research, what do we really know about design's role in infection prevention and control in long-term care? Uh, we started a literature review a year ago uh, with funding from the um, OCLRI, uh, looking at design and long-term care and what was available in terms of the research. And the information uh, in terms of the number of papers we got back was quite sparse and we were surprised by that. But was the, what was even more uh, surprising is when we narrowed our scope to infection prevention control, it was even sparser. So let's look back to 2018. At the time, uh, there were few researchers who were raising the flag about uh, infection prevention control and long-term care pre-pandemic. So Morgan Katz and Aisha Gerses from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine published this paper, arguing for the need to study infection prevention and control in long-term care, and specifically from a human factors perspective. They say here, for, for example, the emergence and spread of extensively multi-drug resistant organisms is a public health crisis and long-term care settings have been identified as a reservoir for the cultivation of these organisms. Long-term care settings are now taking on increasingly ill residents with complicated medical problems, indwelling devices and significant health exposure, all of which are considered risk factors selecting for resistant organisms. Then they go on to say, despite this, guidelines addressing infection prevention procedures in long-term care remain vague and implementation of these guidelines is challenging, largely due to staff turnover, limited resources, knowledge gaps, and lack of organizational support. So why did they talk about human factors? So defining problems and opportunities is particularly difficult in complex conditions or systems, conditions that may be hard to make sense of or changing rapidly. Long-term care, as we witnessed, unfortunately, really fits the complexity criteria and requires broad yet targeted expertise to make sense of this complexity. The field of human factors inherently relies on interdisciplinary collaborations and working with both administrators and frontline workers to holistically define and address issues in complex systems. The profession is focused on improving our understanding of people's interactions with systems, services, or the context in general, and then the outcomes of those interactions. So rather than expecting people to adapt to a design that forces them to work in an uncomfortable and stressful or dangerous way, ergonomists and human factor specialists seek to understand how a product workplace or system can be designed to suit the people who need to use it. This graphic I have here from the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors illustrates the, the umbrella approach of human factors. It shows a circle of various disciplines working together collaboratively, such as design, organizational management, anatomy, engineering, physiology, psychology, and social sciences, using a number of different measures from these disciplines to design tools, software, furniture, workplaces, environments, and even jobs. And all of this is in efforts to support improved processes, techniques, interactions, and communications. So why is design important in infection prevention control, despite the neglect of, of research in this area? 
The list I have here is a partial list, but it gives you a sense of how difficult practicing IPAC can be. It also hints at how design might be involved in some of these difficulties and how if design was better involved, we might be able to support behaviors to support infection prevention control. So uh, I'll go through these, uh, but recognize that this list is, is quite short compared to the actual challenges that people face. So when we're designing for I IPAC, we're designing for something that's invisible. It doesn't give us immediate feedback on the risk of infection that are a result of our behaviors. So that's particularly challenging. We often see poorly designed, located or insufficient quantities of hand hygiene products and specifically hand hygiene at the point of care where we need it most. Skin irritation occurs from hand hygiene, glove discomfort or perception that gloves can replace hand hygiene, the prevalence of high touch surfaces in these environments which may harbor pathogens, crowded conditions with staff and residents in close proximity with each other and in close proximity to high touch surfaces. Ward style or semi-private rooms, which can contribute to crowding and cross-contamination, poorly located supplies, disconnects between the physical layout of space and workflow, time constraints, pace of work, high workload and understaffing, perception that the risk of acquiring or transmitting infections is low, perception that IPAC interferes with staff patient relations or staff resident relations in terms of long-term care, a flawed or incomplete understanding of IPAC protocols. And then with regards to long-term care, there's particular risk factors, especially during COVID-19. The sharing of common spaces and crowding, the home-like design, which may be difficult to maintain, the organic flow of residents, visitors, staff and contractors in and out and within long-term care homes, the lack of social interaction, the lack of physical and cognitive exercise, rapid increases in cognitive decline, pharmaceutical support and hospitalization, residents with dementia having difficulty learning or following IPAC protocols, quality of life and that being supported by links to the familiar, being undermined by how people appear in personal protective equipment or changes in the environment, highly overworked shared labor force with low staff to resident ratios, time pressures and task complexity, limited IPAC training for staff and lack of dedicated IPAC specialists on site and difficulties with grieving around support for end of life care. So you can, you can see that the list is, is extensive and uh, complex. And long-term care homes have key differences from acute care hospitals, but there's also some crossovers and we can learn from examples from other studies. This is an example of, of images from a study I did in neonatal care focused on design for infection prevention and control. And IPAC guidelines are undoubtedly helpful for any organization uh, to support infection prevention and control, but sometimes they may be difficult to support in reality. Katz and Gers has talked about this in their paper, saying efforts to formulate interventions in healthcare will not be successful without understanding the gap between work as imagined something that leadership believes happens or should happen versus work is done or what actually occurs during patient care. And the images I'm showing here uh, are examples of that. So we have the first image on the left showing a nurse wearing PPE, working in crowded conditions, a PPE cart that is too low for her height, an unclean uh, patient chart located next to clean supplies, all items she needs to do her work, but nowhere to put them safely. The second image in the middle shows a housekeeper cleaning each cord of a physiological monitor to prepare the area for a new admission. Every detail you see here needs to be disinfected, with, which is demanding. The third picture shows a nurse on the right, a nurse organizing sterilized medical supplies on top of an incubator because real supply use was perhaps not looked at in the design of the incubator. So if this is happening here, presumably it's happening elsewhere. This is why our research is focused on studying long-term care from a work as done perspective during the pandemic. So our research questions are pretty straightforward. How may the design of homes be impacting infection prevention and control 
and quality of life during the pandemic? In other words, what aspects of home design are working and not working so well within the context of the pandemic to support IPAC and quality of life? And second, how might we rethink the design of homes to improve working and daily experiences during the pandemic or future infectious outbreaks? Our nursing home approach to long-term care emerged in the 60s. This is an article by Alfred Neufeld from the Toronto Star. And what's interesting about Neufeld's article is he points to the key, one of the key drivers of how these homes were designed, biomedical model. And his concerns are that, the, that a biomedical model prioritizes function over social aspects of design. And when I read articles like that, I'm interested in how they relate to design. So traditionally, designers have focused on these considerations in design. This is a user experience framework that I'm going to share with you here. Functionality, usability, and aesthetics. But if we open the box of this UX framework, there are all these other factors which may be just as important to people we're trying to serve. And this includes content, sensual appeal, the emotional appeal of a design, social appeal, sociocultural appeal or identity, managing people's expectations, how designs unfold in space and time. And when I think about time, I find that particularly interesting with, within the context of the pandemic and the duration that this has gone on. The narrative of a design, how the composition of an experience unfolds, for example. And when we look at this, um, you know, you wonder why functionality, usability and aesthetics tend to be the most common or obvious things we do in design. There, there are focal points. We always talk about usability, for example. Um, and when I think about biomedical models, the focus on function has a synergy with this. So what, what we're aiming to do with this framework is go beyond this functional aspect of IPAC to also look at the social considerations in design. And normally this is how we would work with um, homes. So this is one of our, our students from fourth year industrial design last year, Den Denise Pong in a co-design session with an elder at St. Louis residence at Bruyere. And another student, Sophie Nakashima, also in a co-design session um, with an elder. But we can't do that. We have to work remotely now. And that's particularly challenging, especially when we see the cases rising in long-term care homes as we speak. So right now, this is how we're working. This is Anne Pham, a fourth year student currently in our program, who's doing her thesis project on design for long-term care, looking at social spaces to support safer visitation. So she's on Zoom, she's collaborating with the community in long-term care. And she's using tools like Miro, where she um, ideates, sketches, um, day in the life scenarios, and shares this um, uh, with her community to be able to move forward with her design. And we'll be doing something similar in our approach. And this is a diagram that shows the iterative process of design that we'll be participating in, but we're doing only the front end. This is a year long project. So we'll be focusing on identifying um, the opportunities for improvement up to concept designs that uh, respond to what we've learned from the homes. This will involve obviously learning from the homes, asking them questions, um, and then doing some co conceptual um, work uh, and prototyping and evaluating that with homes. These are the key elements of our process. We've already gone through our planning stage, uh, focused on conducting a remote participatory process with homes. We've looked at the ethical and workflow considerations in our REB application. And in order to collect data, we've created cultural probes or diaries that the homes can use to document uh, what's going on. Uh, we have interviews um, as part of our scope with residents to understand their experience as it relates to design, focus group to bring people together to talk about this together, and then co-design sessions to move design forward. And then we'll analyze the, the, the data we collect, uh, um, the narrative we collect, the visuals of the environment, photos of environments, the environment product technologies. Um, and then we'll be 
developing diagrams on the photos and architectural plans um, to synthesize what we found. And we'll be using frameworks like the UX framework I just showed you, but also a human factors IPAC design framework uh, to map and model um, the considerations. And then there's our design response. We'll have three co-design sessions with our homes uh, to move us towards generating uh, a first generation long-term care design strategy guide. And this is just an example of some of those cultural probes that we've designed. This is a staff member photo diary and focus group guide. So this contains various prompts to help them document the challenges in their homes with respect to design. And we also have a resident or family member interview guide to help them think through the details of the design of their home. And I mentioned the Human Factors IPAC design framework. So what we expect to find is that these elements um, that we discovered in our NICU study will also show up in long-term care homes. Uh, namely that the design of the environment is undermining healthcare workers' mental models and therefore understanding of IPAC protocols, practice, that healthcare workers are pressed for time and resources likely finding it difficult to comply with IPAC and may be focused on completing tasks with more obvious rewards or outcomes, that healthcare workers are in constant contact with high touch surfaces while trying to remain vigilant, that healthcare workers are exerting extensive physical and cognitive effort to maintain vigilance, which is not sustainable. And we also expect to find that staff do tasks outside their normal work routines to maintain vigilance, which may support ownership or control over IPAC, but at risk of burnout. And I'd also just like to share that we've been examining the long-term care home design manual. This is the part of the literature review that I mentioned we did last year on the end of life um, and uh, design. And we've been comparing it to best practice in terms of quality of life for our long-term care uh, home design. And uh, we found some interesting um, discrepancies between the design manual and the um, best practice guidelines. The main takeaways uh, for, from the best practice are that smaller homes, smaller cohorts are more desirable, smaller areas for socialization, accessible kitchens for food, prep, food preparation by residents and integrating staff work areas into social spaces. And lastly, I just want to mention the, the frameworks that some uh, researchers in long-term care have been looking at the distinction between institutional models and small home models. And the small home models in looking at the characteristics of these models, I think offer the potential for um, supporting IPAC in, at a number of levels. For example, having small, smaller cohorts in a home can help with contact tracing. Um, having uh, outdoor areas that can be easily accessed by these smaller cohorts can support family visitation. Having uh, small and uh, charting and supervisor areas that are located within these smaller cohorts can reduce uh, cross transmit cross contamination by reducing mobility in the homes. Uh, so these are just a, a few factors that uh, I think uh, have promise for supporting IPAC in the future and should be looked at uh, in more detail with uh, IPAC in mind. And lastly, I just want to show you some examples of uh, work from the Winnipeg uh, Women and Newborn Hospital that Laura mentioned at the beginning. And I have permission to use these photos from my dear colleague, Lynn, Lynn Wilson Orr from Park and Architects. Um, but these are just examples of how we might study those environments. On the left, there's a floor plan where we actually plot out how people are working in the space, the dimension. Uh, we zone clean and soiled areas. You you can see there's a hand hygiene sink upon entry. So it cues you to hand hygiene as soon as you enter a space. And there's decentralized um, nursing areas that we've um, created here. So to prevent uh, movement and also um, better access to patients within the environment. You can see there's also a built-in family space so that it encourages visitation for the family to support and family-centered care. And on the right, there's an image of um, the neonatal um, corridor, family corridor, we call it. 
And the wood wall on the left is actually an acoustic wall to help dampen, these are hard spaces. So to help dampen the sound, um, this is a 1.0 noise reduction coefficient uh, wall and it's perforated. So that means it can be cleaned, it can be disinfected as well. And on the right, you see people sitting in this glassed in area, floor to ceiling, height glass. And what that allows is for people in the winter months uh, to still enjoy borrowed space from the exterior of the hospital. And on this slide, some of the strategies we did for IPAC in this hospital included dedicated, on the right, you'll see a cabinet that's a dedicated um, PPE cabinet for each room in the hospital so that it, it, we avoid having PPE carts in the hallway, which we know is a fire hazard for egress. And down below, sliding doors so that people can use them with their elbows rather than their hands. Sliding doors, this is a single patient room in a labor delivery recovery. And on the top left, you'll see sliding doors that uh, house equipment and that keeps equipment clean if it doesn't get used. So that reduces the potential for housekeeping uh, burnout. And lastly, I'd like to mention one more study that uh, we're working on. Um, it's focused on the experience of long-term care workers who worked at multiple workplaces before the single site work order for long-term care was issued by the Ontario government on April 14th of 2020. The study is part of Dar Dawson Clark's Master of Design thesis, and he's just started recruiting participants for the study. So we'll put the link of this, uh, to this survey uh, in the chat box. And if you are a long-term care worker who was affected by the single order uh, site from the government, we would love to have you participate in um, this research. And this is particularly important that you recall I talked about job design as, as another element of design. If you look at this article from Toronto Star that was just posted a few days ago, in Toronto, a long-term care personal support worker needs to work 50 hours a week to uh, afford the cost of living in Toronto. So that's unsustainable for single site work. So this is another element in that layer of complexity that I was talking to you about in terms of job design that one of our uh, students and also um, the, our uh, members of the research team, Amy Shu and Aniron Bosley are also working on this project. So I'll just conclude by saying there's been calls for design and age, you know, human factors and ergonomics research on IPAC to support long-term care that predate COVID-19, but the studies are rare. So it's time to do more studies in this area. So we hope studying the design of homes during the pandemic can advance our understanding of IPAC and quality of life. It's a highly complex area of design and our attention will be critical to better support our elders, people with disabilities, their families, and the people who are working so hard to serve them. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, Laura? Yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, very informative. Okay, we'll move on to um, some questions. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Um, if you did put anything through the chat, you'll wanna transfer that over to the Q&A section just so we, we don't miss that. Okay. All right, Chantal, uh, first question. So how can physical design of long-term care contribute to mental wellness and resili resilience of residents, family caregivers, and staff? Um, a psychological dimension of resistance to infection. That's a great question. Um, that's such a good question. Thank you. Uh, the, when I showed the user experience framework, I think I was getting at that uh, construct that you're bringing up is that we need to move beyond design that looks at functionality to those more nebulous concepts, which sometimes are hard to get at um, in terms of the, the emotional aspect of the design. Um, the senses, the sensual aspect of the design, uh, the diversity of uh, characteristics, even in terms of the senses and what, what uh, people like and don't like, uh, what they prefer, what they feel comforts them. 
so I think those are the elements that um, we need to focus more attention on. Of course, we do the basic um, uh, assessment of functionality that's so important, but we don't stop there. So the reason I'm showing this picture here at the end, for example, is that I think this, you know, this is a nursing home in the United States. And I think it starts to get at some of those constructs um, uh, around the um, psychological impacts of design and mental health and uh, being outdoors, um, change, offering change to people, especially in this condition. Um, so I think, when we do these studies, uh, varying the, the, the spaces, appealing to the cultural identities of people in these spaces as well is very important for familiarity. I mentioned that in the um, familiarity as being important and not stripping that away because of IPAC. So how do you do that creatively, right? Uh, because these homes are very detailed, uh, they're homes. And uh, so I think it's a really interesting um, area of design for those reasons, because we don't want to make it like a hospital. It's not a hospital, it's a home. Um, and um, so we have to get at some of those uh, psychosocial constructs through being creative. Uh, the, whole, the hospital, for example, I showed you in Winnipeg, we were really trying to move towards a res more residential um, model, uh, social model with that. Uh, we curated it with art, for example, um, that we had artists in uh, Toronto painting. Um, so I think those elements are just as critical to well-being. Great. Our next question. What kinds of things do you expect to find once you start collecting the diaries from home? I expect to find that we will have a lot of information and um, I have no idea how much we're going to get, but I expect that there'll be a lot. Uh, I know in my NICU study, for example, I had close to 500 photos of, um, you know, issues uh, that were related to design and infection prevention control. So I, uh, I expect to find um, if we if we go back to those layers I talked about in the human factors framework here. Um, I'm sure that these elements will come up now the difficulty is because we're not on site. And we're not talking to people normally that's what we would do, we would we would spend a lot of time on site. Um, over various shifts and um, spend time, hang out with the staff and the residents and really hear from them. And we just don't have, we, we don't have the luxury to do that in this study because of the condition we're in. So the photos will show us, um, you know, processes uh, that are challenging for them. They'll have to narrate those for us so that we understand stepwise step what's going on. Um, and, uh, but they may also show us, I'm hoping they show us uh, some of those so psychosocial constructs that uh, the first uh, person who asked that question was asking about um, and narrate those for us as well, because that's just as important. Um, so some of these may be dif more difficult in terms of this framework to, to reveal. And I expect that to be more of a from coming from the narrative from the homes, like for example, normal work routines, uh, people doing work outside their normal work routines. That's not something that we would document in photo, photo diary per se, but in a narrative. So I'm hoping that um, the homes can, can tell us about that. Um, and uh, one of, the, one of the, ch the challenges, the very first piece here, the design of the environment can undermine healthcare workers' mental models. That's gonna be difficult uh, to assess because normally what we would do again is in our shadowing, we would see breaches, for example, and then we would ask um, staff, you know, um, did you think that that was a breach? And we'd ask them whether they thought they had breached or not. And sometimes they may say, no, I don't, I don't think I did, or I didn't quite understand what was going on, or I didn't realize I had to do this um, as part of IPAC. And that's when we get at those constructs around mental models. So that to me is gonna be 
uh, probably a weakness in the study. Um, and until we can go on site when it's safe for researchers to go on site, that may be less developed. Why do you think this recent design manual for long-term care from 2015 is not meeting best practice? A lot of effort went into that design manual over a long time. Um, I would say that really what we've done here is we just compared uh, research papers on best practice in uh, quality of life compared to the manual. And uh, so it's more about what we found in the literature um, that is sometimes uh, conflicting with the manual. So for example, in the dining areas, uh, there's a clause about having no more than four people at a time. And that clause does say, for example, that that's to support more intimate connections with people at the table. Um, but in the best practice of uh, the research we found, is they mentioned the flexibility of the tables to allow, for example, if you want to do more harvest table type settings, or if you want to have family come, that you can group, you can have uh, larger groups of people. Um, so it's more about the flexibility of uh, the, the dining setting as opposed to being prescriptive about um, uh, how many people should be sitting at a table. Uh, another example that's, uh, th this one is particularly um, uh, interesting to me is about the nurse stations being separate from the resident or social areas. Uh, as in the literature, we've been seeing that these stations uh, would be uh, more accessible if they were in social areas and integrated, more familiar in the social areas. And what's interesting to me about that from an IPAC perspective is again, if we start looking at grouping staff and residents in cohorts together, that reduces the amount of movement in a, in a, in a home, right? Um, and so by doing that, that decentralization of those uh, work areas into these more resident areas also um, helps with communication, especially under these difficult uh, circumstances, um, but also limits the amount of traffic of going towards a centralized nursing uh, work workstation area or reporting room, for example. Um, so those are just some of the, we, we really wanted to look at that manual and uh, for the most part, it's consistent with uh, the research and best practice, but there were these elements that were coming out that, were, that differed. And uh, so we, we, found the, we found those differences interesting. Are there other materials such as the acoustic panels that are being studied? I know lack of soft materials slash fabrics is a problem in long-term care homes. Yeah, so um, that's such a good question too and um, very challenging. And I, in my own work, I spent a lot of time on that, researching manufacturers, researching the specifications, seeing what was marketing and what was actually science in terms of um, being able to specify the right materials. So in terms of furniture, for example, I find that particularly challenging. Um, and uh, in the, the hospital you see here, we stopped specifying vinyl uh, for environmental reasons. Uh, also, it uh, off gases, uh, vinyl off gases. Um, it cracks over time as it off gases. So there's other reasons too uh, that, that uh, we didn't specify vinyl. And we moved to other materials like polyurethane. But what we did is, and this is, I suggested to everybody to do this, is the materials that we selected, we had, you know, 15, swatches, for example, we ordered them from the manufacturers. The manufacturers will tell you they're, they're uh, excellent for infection prevention control, but we don't know. So we had them tested. We made up swatches, one foot by one foot um, uh, swatch boards with upholstery underneath them, and we sent them to the hospital. And the hospital tests them with their cleaners. And they will put everything on these, anything that could um, soil the fabric, they will put it on uh, these swatches and they'll let it sit. And then they will try and clean it with their disinfectants and also their cleaners. 
and then they give us the, the results. And we do that over several months so that we really see how the material is um, working under those conditions. So that's just one example. Um, I think acoustics is a very interesting area of infection prevention control. We need to pay more attention to that uh, because these are hard spaces, especially for the hearing impaired. Um, staff communicating, so to support communication between staff, um, to reduce rattling from carts, um, all of those factors are really important. Um, and these spaces are hard because infection prevention control is, is front of mind. Uh, so those are just a few examples I can give you offhand in terms of materials. So will you be studying some of the innovative homes that now exist in Ontario, such as the Butterfly Model and Eden Alternative? These homes use smaller areas with fewer residents and have reported better outcomes during COVID. Yes, and I, I really hope that they, I have at least one home from that model. Um, <clears throat> CARP Ottawa has been uh, wonderful. They've been talking to me and helping me through this study and um, put me in touch with uh, the Glebe Center, which is a butterfly home, uh, for example. And so really what we're doing right now in terms of recruitment is we're consulting with homes. It's challenging for them right now. and. Um, I hope at least I get at least one home, um, a small home design, because I think that's really important to study. So with the real-time experiment that is happening in long-term care homes, is there insight into how COVID-19 has spread following an outbreak being declared and full PPE measures implemented? If the care team is following IPAC practices, how is the infection spreading to residents? I can't, I don't think I can answer that question. Um, uh, it's a good question. I, I don't have enough information to answer that question. And I'm hoping um, that our study can shed some light, perhaps, um, in getting into the details of um, the, the home's design and, and the processes, uh, perhaps shed some light on that. But of course, these are case studies, right? So uh, and the homes are very unique. So we, I I'm reluctant to say whatever we find would be generalizable, but at least it would give us a sense of what's going on. So you mentioned this is a one year study. Do you plan to continue this work and how? Uh, we have to continue this work. Uh, one year is not enough. It's uh, just scratching the surface. Um, I've mentioned the limitations with us being remote. We really need um, to work with people who are on site. We need to work uh, with frontline workers, closely with frontline workers through every step. And we won't be able to do it well uh, remotely. Uh, there are limitations. Um, so, uh, and I, sus I suspect what's going to happen is just by looking at you know, these, these five cases of homes that we're gonna be looking at, that's just going to, going to support uh, more um, uh, research questions, more specific research questions that we want to answer with homes. And so uh, my hope is to develop a, pro a program, a lab in this area, um, support design students and students in other disciplines uh, that we can work together to continue this as a long-term um, uh, study. What countries are considered leaders in their approach to, de to the design of long-term healthcare homes? And where does Canada rank? Oh, I don't know where Canada ranks in that. I'm sorry, I, don't, I, can't, I can't tell you that. Um, but I know um, in terms of the literature we were, we were reviewing, um, one of the questions I had re uh, just recently was about small home designs. So, um, uh, you know, we have some of those in Canada. Um, the butterfly model, the Eden model in, um, and the, the Eden model. Um, in uh, the Netherlands, for example, there's been some uh, villages that have been interesting, uh, smaller homes, literally small homes in a community uh, setting um, with smaller cohorts of, uh, of seniors and staff. Uh, so I think those are the, in Finland, similar studies 
uh, similar projects that are real projects. And um, it would be wonderful um, to also see what's coming out in terms of potential studies on IPAC and those terms. Are you finding new products being developed during COVID to address infection control, such as lighting or other building systems? I think there's a flurry of product design going on right now in infection prevention control. Um, and that's fantastic. Uh, more attention needs to be paid in this area. Certainly, I, I know from the NICU study, there's so many products um, in medical equipment that had so many issues. Um, and, and you wouldn't know them until you looked at how people were, were interacting with them in reality. But I think that's the, the step that really needs to happen. So we can develop a product, but how do we know that, that it's really going to serve what it's meant to serve. So we have, to, if these products are being developed, that's fantastic, but we need to take it in that diagram I showed um, earlier in terms of the, I'll show it quickly, this one. So I modified this diagram. This is a product design framework and it usually ends at product production and construction. Well, I've adapted it and I've added post-evaluation because I, I would argue we don't see enough of that in design. So we'll put products out, but we don't actually see um, their outcomes, how, how they're working in reality for people. So that would be a, a definitive step that has to happen in order to validate the, the uh, product development and infection prevention control. The gap between research and implementation is always a challenge. How do you see your research your research impacting IPAC standards in private care facilities? That is so important. And it's just, that's a good follow-up to the last question I just had, is that we can develop, we can develop concepts and, you know, we can put them into production we can construct a building. Um, but unless we study it afterwards, we don't know if we've advanced um, if we really advanced anything. So in terms of implementation, it's an interesting area, um, certainly because there, there are different strategies in design. Um, there can be short-term strategies, which some people might call incremental solutions, uh, mid-term or longer term, where there's a larger investment, for example, in the renovation of a, of, of a home, uh, or new build. Those are longer term initiatives. Some of the short term strategies to me are really interesting in low, low resource environments. And I'll talk a little bit about the NICU with that because in our NICU study, when we did our design strategy guide, <clears throat> there was a outbreak at the time at the end of my study and they, they needed to implement some solutions. So we implemented the short-term strategies. And what was interesting is then we could see if they were working. And so those short-term strategies that it ended up working in our implementation can then carry forward to longer-term implementation. So I'm a big fan of doing um, short-term interventions, uh, you know, mock-ups, prototypes, and let's see if it's gonna work uh, in situ. Now, right now we've be challenging to do that. We'll have to see what comes out of our concept studies, but there may be opportunities to, um, to later to mock up some of the strategies and have homes try them out and then uh, we can evaluate them within the homes to support implementation. Wonderful. These are all fantastic questions. Yeah. I think we have time for two more. Uh, so first off, how should IPAC be balanced with socio-cultural needs, especially in homes built for people with ethnic backgrounds and may be used to living in different residential environments? You know, that's also a very good question because language is, um, I suspect is a, a big challenge in, in IPAC. Um, communicating protocols, um, if, uh, staff don't speak the same language perhaps as the resident um, and I've witnessed this in my own um, father-in-law who was who died this year uh, in a long-term care home in Alberta um, 
I saw residents who spoke other languages were reverting back to their mother tongue when they were children and staff couldn't communicate with them. So you can imagine trying to communicate IPAC protocols um, to people who don't speak English or French and how, and how we translated those. So those, um, those are more targeted solutions, I think that are per personalized design. And I think technology can be very interesting there in terms of supporting, for example, communication of what's going on in infection prevention control uh, by helping staff translate, for example, or have another area of interest to me is visual cues that are cross cultural um, that can help infection prevention control. So it doesn't just depend on your understanding of English. Um, and there's other facets that I haven't researched that you're bringing up that are interesting, which are people's, um, perhaps their um, perspectives on IPAC based on their cultural background as well uh, is, an, is an area that could be interesting to study. Great questions, wonderful questions. Can I help my study? <laughs> All right, last but not least, uh, can you please comment about the importance of conducting a post-occupant evaluation for long-term care facilities? Are there any post-occupant evaluation guidelines that you would recommend for long-term healthcare centers? I don't know of a post-occupancy guideline for long-term care. I'm sure they probably exist. I haven't come across that, um, but uh, it's vital. Again, I think that's where we learn um, how to improve design. And uh, so it's, it'd be wonderful if that was part of um, construction uh, in terms of uh, RFPs that are issued to uh, firms to uh, renovate or do new builds is that part of the RFP isn't just about designing and implementation but it's about evaluation after implementation as well, lessons learned, uh, so that it can inform the next design. Um, in terms of post-occupancy evaluations, they, they can range. You can have some for mock-ups. So if you're doing uh, like physical mock-ups, one-to-one -one scale of, of you know, key areas, key rooms, um, you can start by evaluating those. And I think mock-ups are amazing. They really mitigate risk. So I would also suggest that that's part of the design process is full scale mockups of uh, rooms and a combination of physical ones and also virtual. Virtual's not there yet um, because again, there's this physicality, which is really important. Um, but those can be used as a, as a part of your evaluation to mitigate the risks of design in the home. So you can run scenarios uh, with with uh, residents, with, with uh, staff, and uh, see if it's really going to work for for your organization. Great. Well, on that note, I wanted to say thank you, Professor Trudeau, um, for all the time you put into this and joining us today. Well, yeah. thank uh, thank you, Laura, for inviting me, and uh, I just want to thank everyone for attending. That's a really important day in the US. So I'm surprised by the turnout. So I thank everyone very much. Yeah, thanks to everyone for making the time to join us today. Um, as you can see, um, I'm just gonna put up a brief survey on the screen. Um, so if you do have the time to fill that out, um, we would be very grateful for your feedback. So answers are anonymous. And yeah, we really hope you enjoyed the conversation today and gained some valuable insight and information. So on the screen, there are also ways to stay connected with the Faculty of Engineering and Design at Carleton University. And please note that our next talk is scheduled for February the 17th with Dr. Ahmed Abdullah. Thank you, stay safe and have a great day.